Welcome to the Jurassic Park cast. The Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park and also not that too. My name is Ryan Rogers and I'm a big dumb Jurassic Park fan. Thank you very much to my special guest for for joining us today, Dan Rose. So now we're learning that there were eight movie raptors originally when the big one came in and she killed all but two of the others. Uh, okay. Okay. I had my numbers. Blocked. Yeah, a little like bit. You killed two. So that's a hot trivia question. How many raptors are there in Jurassic Park? Which I guess, I mean, three, I guess. It feels like there were a lot more, doesn't but, it? Yeah, it always, I don't know, because, well, especially when they go after that, um, that cow. Uh, so the next part here with, uh, with Lost Raptors um, is, it's the scene called Life Found Away. So this, the egg discovery happens well after Grant and the kids run and escape the T-Rex and fall out of the tree and commune with the Brachiosaurus, and Grant stumbles upon the nest. And then just reveals off the top of his head that uh, the frog DNA means that the dinosaurs must be changing genders because some West African frogs are known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single sex environment. And then he chuckles. Jeez, I guess Malcolm was right. So we remember there's only there's only three velociraptors. So like, I don't know, in the like three Western Western African frogs, like wind up in like a trio somewhere one day and just well, I guess I'll be a man then. <laughs> like, how does this happen? <laughs> There's only three. I mean, it sounds like a, an odd number. It would be different if you had, like, a whole bunch. You're like, well, I guess somebody's got to be a man around here. But <laughs> it's so bizarre that there's... What if there were only two? Would one be like, well, I guess I'll just spontaneously change uh, One gender. of us has to do it. Yeah. One of us has to do it. Might as well. <laughs> it's so bizarre. In the novel, there are eight raptors. None are dead. And in fact, Hammond has specifically rejected requests to have the animals destroyed. And the eight of them are in the raptor holding pen, which is a fenced-off area. And in the novel, we learn that the raptors were in the park environment until one got out, killed two construction workers, and maimed a third. And that was the backhoe incident. That was said to be in January. So this novel occurs in August, and so for eight months, the, the novel raptors have been in the raptor holding pen, fitted with extra electronic sensors, so the park is prepared for the next time they escape which is written as basically inevitable because they're natural cage makers. <laughs> so the novels have lived in the park for years and they were breeding and nesting and apparently doing all of this nocturnally beyond the observations of the vets and the feeders and the handlers and all the staff members. Nobody realized these raptors were breeding. It reached a population of 38 in the book, plus a couple that were Jeez. on a boat heading to the mainland who wouldn't have been tabulated in the inventory scan. <laughs> so these raptors are like basically reproducing like gremlins uh, but in the movie there's only three of them and they're in that pen but somehow one of those three probably not the big one because it's still a clever girl so the the big one can't be the boy uh, spont- spontaneously well, changes from female to male of... and then lays an egg that's under a question. tree <laughs> yeah like that is a question of like yeah like the, the electrical fences went down mm-hmm. but the, the actual, like, concrete container they were in didn't go down. No. So, like, there's no reason for them to still have escape. It wasn't just, like, an electrical fence, and then as soon as the electrical fence is off, like, they can just break yeah. through it. So, like, is it, it's a real tough part of the movie where it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's it's consequential, it, it validates what Malcolm was talking about. It it tells this story that life can't be contained, that it breaks free and and uh, and finds a way dangerously, if, if you know, at times. But... It doesn't practically make any sense that these three raptors that were all tied together somehow were somewhere else in the park also having babies. Yeah. Unbeknownst to the handlers that were, like, they can't, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like one of those parts that were adapted from the book, but, like, the connective tissue that was important to, to what was in the book didn't also get adapted into the film. So uh, one of the movie raptors is in the shed and it terrorizes Ellie. And then as Ellie escapes, she conspicuously leaves the gate to the maintenance shed ajar. That's one of the three raptors. It's in the maintenance shed, so if you're keeping track. And then we get to the clever girl scene where while Ellie's fighting her way out of the shed, Muldoon is out in the foliage trying to hunt the other raptors. And there can only be two because there's three and one's in the shed. So, uh, you know, Muldoon spots the one raptor standing motionless. And this is in the novel, too. This part isn't... He doesn't get attacked here, but there's a scene at the beginning where the raptors attack the fence. They're all looking at the fence, and the the one's standing still. And then two attack the fence when nobody's watching or paying attention. 
and uh, and that's how they get their first glimpse at these velociraptors. They think, wow, these are the craziest most. These are even more amazing than I ever thought. Like, they're more dangerous than we could have imagined. And this attack that's there is remember uh, when Grant is making uh, teasing the the giant turkey kid. Yeah, and he's talking about how the yeah, velociraptors. Yeah, yeah. There's one standing still. And you think he doesn't see you, and then you don't see the attack from the two you didn't even see coming from the sides. That is taken right out of this raptor scene at the beginning of the book. And it's put into the scene with Grant where he's terrorizing the kid. And then it's also used here where Muldoon's getting, you know, he's paying attention to the one raptor and doesn't see the other one coming. So this... this... Which is my favorite, like another thing that, like, Muldoon should know that. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> Muldoon what? should know. If Grant knows... Muldoon, you think, would he's the kind of guy who would have studied up on these things and been like, oh, that's the way they attack things. <laughs> the animals are constantly surprising them with their behavior because they're still so new. They don't know enough about them. So That makes sense. So that, um, that, that Muldoon isn't familiar with their pack hunting when there's only three of them isn't unbelievable, I don't think. But, uh, well, I mean, there was eight of them, technically. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Well, seven, because once they introduced the eighth one... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And she must have been tough as a, as a youngster, that's for sure. I mean, how do you kill... Like, do, did, you, did you think, like, she took them all aside and, like, kind of finally killed them, or just, like, mass-murdered, like, six of them all at once? So I've come up with a theory, and I think it's more like the fairy tale of the Frog Prince. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah. There was this beautiful big one and seven suitors, and one by one, each of them turned into a male... But they were not what she was looking for. <laughs> and so she swiped left, literally, <laughs> across their neck to all but two of them until she found her prince. And then she left the raptor pen, laid an egg somewhere out in the, in the, in the woods, and uh, that, that's how it happened. I'm sure of it. I think that's exactly how it happened. Well, I mean, that's probably the best backstory we're going to get for that <laughs> segment of the movie. I don't think anything's been mentioned otherwise. So that's where we're at. That's what it is. That's, that's <laughs> solid. We recall that Muldoon had ordered the command in the opening scene to shoot her, and having overheard the, his observation while at the raptor pen that they remember, these moments should lead us to believe that the big one hasn't forgotten who Muldoon is, and she's been plotting her revenge ever since. And uh, just like, which alien was it where Sigourney Weaver um, wakes up out of her cloning phase and then, like, dates the doctor, and then she goes killing aliens for a bit? Um, the third one, I believe, because it's uh, Charles Dance, who's okay. like a priest slash doctor. Right. Um, this is right out of Alien yeah. Three, then, or before Alien Three. She gets cloned. Yeah. She wakes up. She finds a finds a mate, and then goes uh, and k- killing the things that bother her. <laughs> I mean, so so wait, you're saying that the big one, the clever girl, is Ripley for me? <laughs> it makes sense. There you go. <laughs> I don't know how it makes sense, but sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you dearly for tuning into the Jurassic Park cast. The Jurassic Park podcast where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park and also not that too. Until next time.